How far would you go to survive when the world turns against you? Now that's a heavy question. Welcome back to Bay Area Babylon, where today we find ourselves exploring one of the craziest, most scariest and intense stories I've ever researched. A story that gives us a true account of what happens when dreams collide with nature's fury. Because today we visit the graves of James Reed and his family, who were part of the infamous Donner Party, the desperate group of pioneers who found themselves trapped in a desolate, snowbound landscape, who resorted to cannibalism in order to survive. That's right. Today we are at the Oak Hill Cemetery in BEA beautiful San Jose, California, exploring a true story of survival that veered into the depths of depression and desperation. And today we're going to take our own journey back to the 1840s with James Reed and the Donner Party, ordinary folks pushed to the edge, individuals desperate and hungry, caught in an unforgiving embrace of the Sierra Nevada winter. But first, a brief history lesson. Way back in 1802, two dudes named Lewis and Clark, they blazed a trail across America, becoming the first of the new inhabitants to successfully conquer the true life, death-defying game of surviving it all the way across the country without being eaten by a bear, dying of scurvy, or getting a poison-tipped arrow smacked between the eyes. And trust me, once word got out about the two adventurers' successful crossing, people raced westward to claim their own slice of this newly forming American dream. Now, despite this was already the ancestral homeland of indigenous people and legally belonging to Mexico at the time, well, that didn't deter the pioneers from flocking westward in droves. It was called Manifest Destiny, and that meant that the land grab out here on the wild west coast was on, baby. Everybody and their brother wanted to get on the action, claim themselves a piece of the golden land out here. And that's how our Bay Area Babylon story begins today, way back in the spring of 1846, when James Reed was living in the small town of Springfield, Illinois. Now James Reed, he had a problem. He just declared bankruptcy and was now looking for a way to get his family up and out of Illinois so they could start a new life, start a new life out west. And wouldn't you know it, as luck would have it, Reed ran into a fella named George Donner who just happened to be packing up and taking his own family out west, out to California. And yeah, sure, the Reed family could join up with them on their trek across the country. And with that agreement, the formation of the Donner Reed Party, it was originally known, that's when it took place. Now, being a librarian, I wouldn't be doing my duty if I didn't let you know that at the heart of this story was none other than, guess what? A book. A book titled The Immigrant's Guide to California and Oregon, written by a guy named Lansford Hastings. Now this Lansford Hastings fellow, he described California in all of its beautiful, glowing glory, enticing people westward. But some claim that old Lansford, well, he was just trying to line his own pockets and capitalize on the westward migration. But whatever, what types of profits Hastings had going on didn't matter anything to the Donna Reed party and had no effect on them. But what did have an effect on them was the fact that Hastings wasn't exactly upfront with the truth in his guidebook because he encouraged the readers to take a different trail than the main one that people had been using to get to California. He talked about a shortcut called the Hastings Cutoff that would shave off over 200 miles from the long, rugged journey, when in reality, it actually added on about 125 miles. But who's counting? Anyways, this shortcut, well, that sounded just great to James Reed. But of course, there was a catch. See, what Reed, nor anyone else who read the book didn't know was that Lansford Hastings had never even traveled the new cutoff trail himself. Never! And that meant he was pretty much sending people out blindly into uncharted wilderness, not knowing anything about its terrain or its weather patterns. Very dangerous. And we got to understand here that every year, wagon trains would need to leave for the West Coast during a certain time of year, late enough in the spring so that the animals could feed on the grass, but still early enough so they wouldn't have to drive through snowy mountaintops and try to summit icy peaks during the winter. But the Donner Party got off on the wrong foot and hit the road like way too late, ultimately preventing them from missing out on the window of good weather that they needed to actually make it up and over the Sierra Nevada mountains, not get caught in one of those hellacious winter storms that they had heard about. 
And one of the reasons they were getting a late start was because James Reed, well, he had a lot of legal and financial troubles brewing back in Illinois. And just as a side note, helping him handle his financial woes was his old pal, a young lawyer named Abraham Lincoln. And apparently, Reed tried convincing Honest Abe to join them on their trek across the country. And even though Lincoln really wanted to get to California himself, he passed on the opportunity to focus on his own political career. But anyways, back to James Reed. So then Reed and the 86 other members of the Donner Party headed out for their fateful journey in April of 1846. Heavy rains and flooded rivers caused more delays in their travel. But overall, the first few months of their journey were pretty chill, pretty okay. Because at that time, they were still following the well-known Oregon Trail. And by following that trail, the Donner Reed caravan eventually made it to the Little Sandy River in what's today southern Wyoming without any major catastrophes up to that point. And it was there in Little Sandy where the most crucial decision of the trip would be made. They could either take the more established path heading north towards Fort Hall, or they could take the southern route, leading them through the unproven Hastings Cutoff. You need to understand, James Reed was all in on the Hastings book, and he let everybody know about it. Reed believed that taking the cutoff would make their trip that much faster. He was ready to roll the dice. Then Reed's vote was even strengthened more when a letter arrived to the party from none other than the man himself, Lansford Hastings. The letter was part of Hastings' PR campaign, encouraging all westward travelers to take his trail and save themselves the trouble and the time of going north. And to sweeten the deal, Hastings assured the travelers that he himself was out there on that trail, leading a different band of travelers to California. And it would be a good idea if they all met up and banded together at a place called Fort Bridger. How convenient. But you see, many people in the party, they didn't agree with James Reed, and they wanted to stick to the proven path instead. And it was on July 20th that the caravan split, one group opting for the northern route while the Donners and the Reeds headed south. Destination, Hastings Cutoff. Now this was a big decision, because not only was the group splitting up, but the donner Reed party was also losing valuable workers, wagon drivers, and trail guides. This was a problem, because the donner Reeds had considerably less experience braving the wilderness. And this truly is where things start to go south for the Donner party, because, well, what they didn't know was that a reporter named Edwin Bryant had already been to the Hastings Cutoff a week before and saw that there was no way in hell that wagons could get through this rough, steep terrain. And knowing about the Donner Party, well, Bryant tried doing them a solid and sent a letter back up the trail warning them to steer clear of the Hastings Cutoff. But unfortunately, the letters were received by an explorer named Jim Bridger, who'd recently set up his own trading post along the Hastings routes and he aimed to make a heavy profit from all the incoming traffic along the trail. And pulling a complete shitbag move, Bridger assured the Donner Party that the trail was just fine to use. No problem at all. To make the situation even more troubling was that Bryant's letters wouldn't have been the only thing that had warned them to stay clear off the Hastings Cutoff. Apparently, one of James Reed's wartime pals named James Clyborne, he also warned Reed not to trust the Hastings map, but it was no use. James Reed, whose family motto was persevere, was a man who made up his mind and went for it. And so James Reed rolled the dice after his vote won out, and he led the group south through the treacherous Hastings Cutoff. And so, over the next few weeks, the caravan came to find out firsthand just how rough and rugged the country was, and worse yet, how big of a mistake they had made by listening to James Reed. Because by the time they caught sight of the Great Salt Lake on August 20th, the group had already lost several weeks worth of time braving the untamed path. And now, traveling through the Great Salt Lake Desert, caravan members, well, they were hungry, running out of supplies, and ticked off over the loss of time. Besides, they were almost out of water, and their horses needed to be fed. But the time just kept ticking. The weary caravan didn't get back onto the established trail until September 26th, and by that time, they were in deep trouble, primarily because the shortcut that Hastings and Bridger had told them about, well, that saved them no time at all. In fact, it made them that much more late 
so much so about an entire month. Now running on fumes, the caravan made its way alongside the Humboldt River, where tensions began to run high. But then, the shit hit the fan. One of the cattle drivers, well, he brought his steer a little too close to another herd, this one belonging to James Reed. And in all the commotion, the animals became tangled with each other, right there on the side of the mountain. And that's when the driver of the first set of cattle became so irate that he began to beat the poor animals. But that's when James Reed stepped in. He tried to calm the driver down, but instead that just pissed the guy off even more. And for Reed's efforts, he received several whacks over the head from the driver's bullwhip. And things went from bad to worse when Reed's wife Margaret tried to intervene. But the driver was so enraged, he tossed her to the ground. Well, that was just the last straw for James Reed, who wasted no time and plunged his steel hunting knife deep inside the driver's collarbone, puncturing his lungs and killing him instantly. Now, murder was a big deal, but stuck out in the middle of nowhere, the group felt that they couldn't properly try Reed for his crime, so instead they banished him completely, and that way he was forced to make his own way into California while his wife and kids stayed back with the rest of the group. But that wasn't all. They also sent James Reed out there into the wilderness, alone without a gun. And back in those days, that meant your ass. But luckily, Reed had a very brave stepdaughter named Virginia, who snuck out of the camp that night and delivered to her father on his first night out of the camp a gun and supplies. And this pretty much saved his ass and pulled it out of the fire. And so James Reed was able to continue on his mad dash towards California in order to rescue his family. And after almost starving to death, Reed finally arrived at Sutter's Fort in California, which is also known as present day Sacramento. But when he attempted his first rescue mission to save his family, he was stonewalled by an intensifying blizzard that had made the mountain impassable. With his family freezing and starving to death up in the mountains, James Reed got to work and rounded up a rescue party. But to do this, he would also have to make some sacrifices of his own, which we'll hear about in just a minute. But for now, the Donner Party, after Reed's vanishment, well, their race to cross up over the Sierra Nevada mountain range was on. And by late October, the Donner Party members were staring at a 7,000 foot vertical slope that looked nearly impossible to summit. But screw it, they'd come this far, so they had to take a shot. And while the party was making its final plans to summit the mountain, it began to snow, and snow, and snow some more. And sadly for the Donner Party, they didn't make it in time, because the snow had fallen so heavily, it blocked them from getting up that mountain pass. And one by one, each family exited the mountain, and proceeded down to set up camp down in the valley floor, all the while not knowing of this Sierra Nevada winter, and what it had in store for them. And with this grim news fresh in their mind, it's not difficult to imagine that there were a lot of hard feelings and mistrust among the group and different families. So much so that they uh, decided to set up quarters along the valley floor separately. So there were actually three separate camps. Now the members of the Donner Party, they took shelter and set up camp in what is today now Donner Lake. 81 people were now in that camp and half of them were younger than 18 years old. Six of them were babies. And with so many people and mouths to feed and with such little food, this is a very trying time. Fishing the lake didn't seem to work either. And with winter laying down some heavy, heavy snow, most of the forest animals had hibernated or moved to lower levels of the mountain. So it was really, really slim pickings up there for those poor folks. And the entire time, it never, never stopped snowing. The blizzard raged for days on end and before they knew it, snow piled up to over 15 feet high. And that was a problem because none of these makeshift lodgings had windows or doors. So in order to get inside or out, they had to dig a large hole to crawl through. But the never ending snow made that almost impossible to do and kept people crowded and shut in to their tight, small little huts. Now eventually, after all the regular rations ran dry, the pack animals and the family pets, they ended up on the menu. Some party members resorted to eating boiled down bones, while others cooked their oxide wagon covers until they turned into this sticky, gelatinous substance a human being could somehow choke down. They killed mice and ate them as well too, tree bark and leather shoestrings as well. And after days and days of not eating, people were so weak that they could hardly move. And between the snow and the hunger, it's not surprising that the Donner Party members began to deteriorate from being trapped inside their shelters for days on end. Then after a month and a half of freezing to death, a group of 17 brave men and women, and yes, even a few kids, a group known as the Forlorn Hope, well, they whipped themselves up some makeshift snowshoes and set out to conquer that peak 
and finally make it over there yonder to California. But the escape attempt was met with freezing temperatures, over exhaustion, and having to get through snow drifts that seemed to reach the heavens. These horrid conditions were so miserable and so unbearable that some of the group members actually turned back towards camp. Then finally, desperation set in, and discussions about cannibalism began to perk up among the group members. Cattle driver, his name was Patrick Dolan, well, he suggested eating each other, but the group hesitated at first. But after another day out there in the blinding snow and freezing cold, they quickly changed their opinion on that whole cannibalism thing, and it was decided that lots would be drawn to determine which one of them would be sacrificed to supply food for the rest. And sure enough, Patrick Dolan, he drew the shortest straw, only his companions couldn't bring themselves to kill him. So they decided to wait until someone else died. And it just so happened to be that two days later, Patrick Dolan himself, suffering from hypothermia, passed away at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And sure enough, Patrick, well, he was first to be cannibalized. But he wasn't the only one. A day later, while out hunting, another member of the Forlorn Hope died, and he was quickly carved up for food. And it was this food that gave the remaining members the nutrition that they needed to make it up over the next mountain and the mountain after that. And eventually, the few remaining members found a Miwok camp and received help after 33 days of hiking the Sierra Nevada mountains in a full-on raging blizzard. But by that point, only seven out of the original 17 Forlorn Hope members survived. Now, this whole time, the entire Donner Party was marooned up in the mountains. James Reed was right here in good old San Jose, California, trying to wrangle up some rescue efforts to help his family and friends up there in the mountains. And just by freak chance, there happened to be a war going on at the same time, specifically the Mexican-American War. And with Reed's prior military experience, he was quickly snapped up and sent off to fight in the Battle of Santa Clara. Now, Reed got involved in the fighting because he was promised relief support to help his family and friends if he took part in the war, which he did. And as a result, the good citizens of San Jose here collected their funds and supported Reed and his relief effort towards getting his family back safe. Nice job, San Jose. And that's when facing extreme conditions and against all odds, James Reed, a man of determination and grit, he rallied a band of men together, gathered up the essential supplies, and marked his next stop, the frozen Sierra Nevada mountains. Now there was one rescue party ahead of Reed and they were actually able to get through to the frozen travelers. And not long after, while trekking through the snow drifts and rugged peaks, James Reed encountered his family, his wife Margaret, stepdaughter Virginia, and son James Jr. emerging from the formidable mountains. Emotions ran high in a heartfelt reunion, but it was a short-lived reunion because there was no time for lingering embraces. James Reed still had children stuck up in the mountains that he had promised his wife to rescue. And James Reed, well, he aimed to keep that promise. Reed and his men pressed onwards towards the camp, where the fate of his remaining children, Martha and Thomas, hung in the balance. And after being pinned down by another blizzard right at the top of Donner Peak, Reed and his men descended into the camp to find his children alive. And even though many of the others resorted to eating the deceased, James Reed was assured that none of his family members resorted to cannibalism during that horrifying ordeal. But as for the rest of the camp, well, James Reed, he was obviously horrified by the ungodly carnage. He saw that the other members of the Donner Party had indeed resorted to cannibalism, and that left some very, very gruesome sights and evidence in their wake. In April, a team of soldiers managed to reach the winter camp to finally bury the dead. And it was in this aftermath that revealed the extent of the tragedy, with only 48 people surviving. The ordeal marked by hunger, cold, and desperation, and ultimately claimed the lives of innocent people. And it was this group of troops that pretty much served as a cleanup crew for the entire ordeal. Author Edward Bryant wrote in his book titled, What I Saw in California, the following. Strewn around the cabins were dislocated, broken bones, skulls, human skeletons in short, and every variety of mutilation a more revolting and appalling spectacle I'd never witnessed." End quote. They buried all the bodies in one big grave, 
Then they took everything the party had in their houses and had to set it on fire. Because the U.S. supported expansionism, media stories about the party tended to focus on how brave and heroic the pioneers were, downplaying or pretty much deleting the fact that some of the people in the party ate one another. However, some California newspapers took the opposite stance and wrote in graphic detail, creating a more, much more juicy story. As we reflect on this chapter in history, let it be a somber yet instructive lesson to take away from today, urging us to respect Mother Nature and tread with both ambition and caution. But as for James Reed, well, he and his family settled right here on a 500-acre ranch between First Street and what's now Coyote Creek and what is now the downtown section of San Jose. In 1849, Reed became the chief police of San Jose Police Department. Reed also became a real estate developer and started a mining enterprise to boot. And during the California statehood process, Reed was the leading proponent to make San Jose the actual capital of California. But that honor went to our neighbors up the road in Sacramento. You gotta hand it to James Reed. He was always willing to take a swing the Reeds laid down their roots here in the Bay Area, specifically San Jose, and their names can even be seen on the downtown street signs, honoring the former pioneers. So the next time you're driving down Reed Street, Virginia Street, Margaret, Patterson, Lewis, or any of the sort, you now know who they're named after. And as we exit this episode of Bay Area Babylon, just walking among the resting places of James Reed and his family, I can't help but to feel the weight of history and horror what those unfortunate people had to go through in order to survive is beyond imaginable. And standing here today, it's clear that each grave tells a story, a story of dreams met with the harsh realities of nature. But in the end, all the members of the James Reed family were tough enough to survive that frozen camp and make it up and over that mountain, proving that the resilience of the human spirit and heart are well alive. Now, being a child of the 80s, I grew up playing a computer game called the Oregon Trail. You probably heard of it. And despite contracting cholera, scurvy, and breaking a few hundred legs along the route, I was never given the option to take a bite out of the wagon driver's arm in order to survive. And if you want even more grisly stories and insane info on these troubled travelers, then you gotta check out a book called The Indifferent Stars Above, The Harrowing Saga of the Donner Party by author Daniel James Brown. Published in 2015, this is a historical account that chronicles the tragic journey of a group of pioneers that ventured out west to California in 1846. Now we just grazed over the surface of all the scary experiences the Donner Party faced in today's video, but if you're itching for more, you're in luck because Brown goes into great detail examining the harrowing events that led to the group's entrapment in the snow-covered Sierra Mountains during that brutal winter. The Indifferent Stars Above starts off with a close look at the individual families that made up the Donner Party, and why it was so important for each of these families to make it to California. But soon after, the book takes a nightmarish turn as the group gets stranded by an early snowstorm and the entire party faces severe hardships that test the limits of the human endurance. Now let me assure you, my friends, this book does not shy away from the gruesome realities faced by the Donner Party, and it offers a vivid portrayal of the physical and psychological toll on the individuals caught in a living nightmare. You'll feel their dreams, their fears, their struggles. In fact, it's like you're right there with them, freezing your own butt off. And as the winter progresses, the story unfolds with a mix of tragedy and resilience. Brown explores the complex dynamics within the group, shedding light on the sacrifices made and the moral dilemmas faced by the pioneers. Against the backdrop of a merciless wilderness and with the indifferent stars above, the Donner Party's ordeal becomes a poignant exploration of human spirit's capacity for endurance and survival. The Indifferent Stars Above isn't your typical nonfiction tale. It's a page turner that explores the wild choices made by people when they're faced with extreme circumstances. Daniel James Brown's superb storytelling skills, paired with a historical deep dive, turns this book into a roller coaster ride through one of the darkest chapters in the American West. And it's definitely worth picking up at your local library. And as always, if your local library doesn't carry this title, talk to the reference librarian about placing an interlibrary loan 
or ILL, those of you in the library business, so they can actually borrow the book from a different library system or potentially purchase it for theirs. Please be sure to catch another episode next week. Be sure to hit that like and subscribe button. We'll see you next time on Bay Area Babylon. Until then, keep being the hero of your own story. And as always, stay cool, but not cold like the Donner Party. <laughs> we'll see you next time.